do have our normal announcements, stretching and stretching, and stretching and strengthening exercises on Tuesday and Wednesdays. And Bible study, I think, is still going to continue on. They're just reading from the Psalms and just explaining with each other what the, what the Psalms tell us each and every day. And of course, we've got our adult Sunday school at 9.45 this week. Okay, let's turn our hearts and minds to worship, and we'll listen to our choral introit.
let us recite together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We continue to lift up those in our church family and really throughout the world that need our prayers. We certainly remember Marlene who has come down with COVID and is the reason we've had to reschedule our yard sale. We continue to keep Kelly Anderson, who's had her brain procedure tumor on the 15th and continues her recovery. We lift up Richard Trumbull, whose family to the new friends of ours who are coming visiting, and uh, they hope to be with us, but they wanted to exercise all due caution, so they've taken these weeks off for that reason. We continue to lift up Linda. She did do very well in her procedure and has wonderful results, but continues her recovery. Remember Kathleen and Danny, Walter, James, Harold, Chris Ward, Bobby, Carol Dandy, Dusty Taylor, Debbie Coon's sister, Joyce, Pat's Marlene's cousin, Erica Smith, who's the 17-year-old who's going to have brain surgery in just a few weeks. So you can imagine she's quite, quite frightened by that. We remember the Rosenbachs, our missionaries in Germany, and of course, we continue to lift up the people of Uvalde, who suffered that horrible tragedy, as we do the people of Ukraine and Russia. Are there any other joys or concerns we want to lift up in our time of prayer? If not, let's bow our heads then and go to our God in prayer. Lord, you are the Holy One. And you loved us so much, you sent Jesus so that we can have our sins forgiven. We might be considered holy in your grace, in your eyes. And because you consider us holy, we are able then to receive the power of your Holy Spirit who opens the scriptures to us, who whispers in the depths of our soul the steps that we need to take to follow your plan for our lives, who empowers us and gifts us to truly be the church. And we give you thanks on this day in particular, but surely every day when we turn to your spirit in the depths of our soul and listen to what he has for us. So God, we ask today that you embolden us to receive the power of your Spirit, the power that comes to us when we place our faith in you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to proclaim and testify to the wondrous things you do for us, not only the forgiveness of our sins, but the gifts you give us and the abilities that you give us to truly be the church in this time and in this place. For we need your strength. We need your courage to proclaim the good news of your love and your presence both within us and for the world. Because God, you know us too well. You know that we would very much like to be like the disciples who ran away to the upper room after the crucifixions. Because we're just like them. We would rather hide and mutter or just be silent than tell the world of the power of your love. The story of disciples hiding in the upper room is actually comfortable for us. We want to run and hide, 
But you have come to us in the power of your resurrection's love. You have seen, we have seen the prints of the nails in your hands and in your side. We walked with you on the shores of Galilee after your death. We know you're real. We know that even though we have fears and uncertainties, you are still with us. Come to us, Papa. You know that we would prefer to, to settle into our nice, comfortable lives that you have provided for us. We get tired and wonder if we have anything left to give of the talents. And then your spirit speaks to us from the depths of our soul. Go forth and do. Because the world is a difficult place. We want people to like us, and so we hold back on the proclamation of our faith. Forgive us, Father. We wouldn't want to offend anyone, but the truth is that your love and your grace are not offensive. They're things that everyone longs for, everyone needs to hear. Send your Holy Spirit upon us today, Lord. Let the rushing wind of your Holy Spirit be with us and stir us up for action, for good, and for healing. Let the flame, the power of your love, ignite our hearts with passion for justice. Lord, we brought to you this morning the names of all of those we know and some we've kept in our hearts who need your healing touch, need your comforting presence in the depths of their soul. Be with each, O oh Lord, we pray, give strength and wisdom to doctors and care providers. We also lift up to you the leaders of our great country and truly of the world in this difficult time. They need your wisdom and your grace. Be with each, O oh Lord, we pray. We lift up to you the men and women who stand in harm's way for our defense. Keep them safe. Bring them home, O oh Lord, we pray. And Father, come to each of us in the power of your spirit. Gift us, talent us, so that we might be the healing presence of you in this world. Help us to be bold in our proclamation of your great good news for each and every one is a sinner that needs your love and presence their lives. Father, we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus. And as he taught us so, now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the people of Rome. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Paul speaks to us of the purpose of the Spirit in our lives. Let's hear God's word. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now for children we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order to, we may also share in his glory leads to reading of our epistle lesson. This time we're going to invite our ushers to come forward for our time of offering. Let us pray. Father, you are the Holy One, and your love shines on us in the power of Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit. Your Spirit to guide us and strengthen us. Renew within us that bright light that you have for us as we return a portion of your many blessings to you and your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
title today is Overcoming Babel. Seems an odd title. You remember Babel is the, the people who decided that they were going to thwart God by building a tower. Thwart God's purpose for their lives. It's Pentecost, the birth of the church, and the day to welcome new members. Pentecost is also the day that we are sent. Sent by God, overcoming our fears of the unknown, our propensity to stay where we are comfortable, where we know the language, where we know the routine. It's kind of what the people of Babel were doing. They got comfortable. But they didn't do what God called them to do. They did what they were comfortable with. And so God has created diversity to enhance our human experience and invites us to overcome our differences, find true unity. But unity not in ourselves, in our own desires, in our inclinations to go for safe and easy passages. Unity in God, knowing that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing that he is our God one who directs us, the one who has planned for our good, if we would but listen to him, listen to the power of his spirit in the depths of our soul. This is why Easter so naturally flows into Pentecost. Jesus dies on the cross for all of us. He's resurrected from the grave, shows himself alive, and finishes his earthly ministry, promising the spirits, promising one who will continue his work in each one of us, not just a single being, but a Holy Spirit with the power to touch each and every one of our lives through the power of his love and his grace. Jesus says, God will send his Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Power to be my witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. See, that's always God's goal. To reach all of humanity with his love and his grace, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the ends of the earth that Jesus is talking about includes all of mankind in all her rich diversity. Because we have all sinned, all human beings have sinned, fallen short of God's glory. And we're all equal in God's eyes. We all need to hear from our Lord and Savior. Accept Jesus, accept his work on the cross. That's why our title this morning is about overcoming Babel, which refers to the Tower of Babel. That's found, the story is found in Genesis chapter 11. The story of man's hubris, our desire to be ourselves and not follow God's authority for us. Because in the story of Adam and Eve, mankind seeks to be like God. That's why they ate from the fruit of the tree. Reaching up to heaven with a tower is what Babel wants to do. They want to be able to approach God on their own terms and not on God's. So God comes down to mankind and creates language, languages that separate us because as the people were speaking, it seemed to each of them that they were just babbling utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Hence the name, the Tower of Babel. But there's more to that story than man's hubris overcoming God's authority. It's about mankind spread over the face of the earth at this moment because God loves diversity. And diversity is created not just because God loves us, but because it's best for us. We need to stretch. We need to see the unknown. We need to trust God will get us through no matter what this world throws at us. We have to get over our fears of those that are different, of the unknown, and fulfill God's vision for all of mankind through each and every one of us. A rich diversity of people who love God, proclaim his glory to the ends of the earth, shine his light so that all of mankind will one day have the opportunity to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we do this by overcoming Babel, overcoming our propensity to do life our ways rather than God's, to remain in our comfortable space. We overcome Babel by going forth the power of his Holy Spirit in the depths of our soul, listening to his spirit in us, receiving the gifts he's given to each one of us to do the ministry he has called us to do, and then uniting in our diversity and truly shining God's light to the ends of the earth for the glory of God. So 
so that God would be magnified in all that we do and all that we say as the people of God, as the church. This is why Jesus sends us from here where we're comfortable, out into the world, out to the ends of the earth to proclaim his gospel, to bring us together in the same unity that he and Father and Son and Holy Spirit have already. The Spirit empowers us to be Christ, to be like Christ, and to join with all of mankind into the bride of Christ. Overcoming Babel isn't easy for any of us, but it is God's will for us. And if it does, it's God's will for us. He provides the way to make that happen. If we would but stop and listen to the power of his Holy Spirit in us. Our scripture this morning is our traditional Pentecost reading found in Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. You'll remember that Pentecost in the days of Jesus was about the Feast of the Weeks. And it happens 50 days after Easter for us, the Passover for the Jewish people. Let's hear God's word. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house that was sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak to another in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Pyrogyra and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Christians and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He gives us his holy word. He sends to us his Holy Spirit. He gifts us with the things that we need to be the church. But we still have our part to do, to listen and hear, and step out in faith and do. Because the people of Babel built their city to defy what God wanted them to do, our scriptures say in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 says the explanation for the building of the tower is that otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Exactly what God wanted, they did not want to do. You know, from a human perspective, it was perfectly understandable what they wanted to do. Safety is our number one priority. Fear of the unknown is a great motivator for all of us. Avoiding risks. Avoiding change is one of our prime directives to achieve the safety we crave. Yet God seems to want something else for us. Faith in Him. Trust in Him. Knowing that no matter what the world throws at us, God will get us through if we but trust in Him. If we but step out in faith. God seems to imply that we were created for more than we can envision on our own. That we would be less than what we could be if we chose to live the safe life. Because safety is an illusion we tell ourselves to keep ourselves comfortable, to 
It's not real. Only faith in God is real. Only trusting in his plan for our lives truly gives us the safety that we crave. And diversity is more than a present reality. It is God's gift to each one of us, and it's inspired for our good to stretch us, to enable us to truly be the children of God that he has created, that he has planned for from the beginning of time. We need to learn from each other if we're going to become the people God has called us to be. God gives us diversity to enhance our human experience and invites us to overcome our differences, to find true unity not based on fear or complacency, but full of the richness of living in relationships with those who stretch us and challenge us to be more than we thought we could be. God has a plan for all of us. It means we need to go out and do and be in God's grace, in God's power the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts he gives us through his Holy Spirit. Unity in diversity is the plan. The plan we signed up for when we gave our lives to Jesus. Never forget that Jesus died for all of mankind to be saved. And in his death and resurrection, we are given life in his blood. Our eternal life does have a cost. We have to accept the fact that God is God and God is our God and his plan is greater than ours. He knows what's best even when we don't. That whether or not we like it, God's love extends to all of mankind, even our enemies. Those we fight across the battlefields of life are also loved by God who sent his son to save us and all of them. Our job is to reach out to all of mankind with the love of Christ. This is the power of Pentecost, an imbuing of God's spirit into each of us that makes us more than we can be on our own. Because God's spirit opens our eyes with his love to all of us, shows us who they are, how much they are loved, just as we are loved. Because we all long for a familiar song, for the language of home. We long for those connections. That's what we heard on the Pentecost morning. Different languages being spoken so that all of humanity can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own tongues. Those people stopped and listened, some wondering, and I suspect some hoping that God was here, present, active in their lives, showing them the good news of Jesus Christ. Of course, there were also those who scoffed at what was happening. They muttered, they must be drunk. Well, if that's drinking alcohol allows you to speak a foreign language, I'm all for that. But of course, we all know that's not possible. Drinking alcohol does not give us special senses, although sometimes we think it does. Paul doesn't choose that defense. He says it's only 9 o'clock. We can't be drunk yet. The tongues that were not quite like fire and not really like tongues either, but some visible manifestation of the invisible presence of God's Holy Spirit in our world comes down upon the disciples, empowers them to speak the gospel in different languages, to overcome what happened in the Tower of Babel by opening up people to speak different languages and reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was one presence, one sound, and it was heard by each of the disciples. It was heard by all of the people who then echoed that sound that they heard, echoed the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in foreign tongues. It wasn't an experience that they could keep to themselves. That much is plain. It was meant to be shared. It was meant to build community, the church of Jesus Christ. It's what the Holy Spirit is really all about. It's what Pentecost is really all about. The power of the Spirit comes to us in order to build community, to build the church, if we can get over ourselves sometimes. It's overcoming those differences. It's making connections that really build up the body. Pentecost is about the church being the church. Pentecost reminds us that this is a small world. Wherever we go, you're likely to find members of God's holy family reading the word, listening to the Spirit, empowering them to also be the church. The church that we all belong to, God's universal church. Pentecost needs to remind us that we're all one in Christ. 
We are all one because God longs for all of us to be one. God longs for us to be one as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. When we become one, when we unite together, we become the bride of Christ, empowered to shine his light, empowered to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And the glue and the process of this new life in God is God's love for us that comes to us because of the sacrifice of his son on the cross of Calvary through the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that comes to us at Pentecost. And this is why we celebrate Pentecost as the birth of the church. Because at Pentecost, we receive the power, the Holy Spirit power to be the church, to love as God loves to sacrifice as Jesus did, to be the truest manifestation possible of who God is, of his love for the world, and to step out in faith and do and be that church. So how about it? Are you willing to overcome all of our inherent desires to be Babel, to cling to what is comfortable and known in order to become that which God has crafted us to be, one in him, one in the world, unity in his love, because that's the power, the true power of Pentecost. His Holy Spirit coming to us, opening our eyes to his love for all, empowering us, gifting us to be Christ today. So that's the question, will we take his gift of love for the world and step out and proclaim the glory of God from here to the ends of the earth? Will we listen and do as the Holy Spirit calls us to? Let us pray. Lord, you truly are our God. And we can't fathom the depth of your love in each one of us for each one of us and for the world. Lord, send your spirit to each of us gathered here that we may truly become the church that you have called us to be, truly become the Christians who hear your will, step out in your love, and do all that you call us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. We are.
And we have the awesome privilege of inviting our countryman and new member to come forward and see. Thank you. Liturgy will use starts on page 33, but it's a piece of liturgy that actually encompasses many different forms. Our response that we have for the congregation is actually found on page 38, so if you would please uh, accept and open your hymnals to at least page 30. We will be jumping around in the liturgy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmations of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptisms, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. Derek Weaver of Confirmation, I present Stacey Nell, who comes transferring her doctrine of membership from the West Gate UMC and Harlingen, Texas. Since the earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil, and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. Parents or other sponsors reaffirm these vows for themselves while taking the responsibilities of sponsorship. Candidates for confirmation profess for themselves the solemn vows that they were made at their baptisms. So, folks, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves and so say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, and so say, I do. Derek Thomas Weaver, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you have lived, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Derek, I confirm you as a full member of Christ's holy church and a member of this church, that you may serve faithfully in this place and in this time. Amen. So folks, as members of Christ's universal church, Will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And so said, I don't know. In congregation, Burke, chapter 16 says, Pastor, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation, United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Body of Christ Church, please welcome our new members. There will be a fellowship, appropriate ice cream for Derek, and cake for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
open your hymnals to page 12 for service word and table two. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here's the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners that proved God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Turning to page 13 for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. And a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke that bread, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, hey, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts done in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with the Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heaven's great. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ, his new covenants in his blood, given that we might have life today and life forevermore. His body and his blood given for us. To remind us of what he has done, to remind us of what he and the power of the Spirit is doing today in the great feast that we will one day have with him and all the church in heaven. But our musicians can do. We praise your name. We thank you, first, of course, for Jesus, for the love you shared with us in his life and in his sacrifice, and for raising him up on Easter morning. 
that we might have the truest example of how to live our lives. Then in the power of your grace and love, you sent us your Holy Spirit to gift us and empower us to be Christ today. So Lord, come to us, help us so to live that you are glorified in all that we do, in all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as you're able for our closing hymn, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.